You know, when I first started watching Mythic Quest and I was thinking about what I was going to make this video about and what the general topic of it was going to be, I thought I was going to talk about how this is a generic workplace sitcom, just like Parks and Rec is a workplace sitcom about a government building, the office is about an office, you know, a paper company, Silicon Valley is about this startup, Brooklyn Nine-Nine is about a police station, and so on and so forth, and I thought this was going to be just another workplace sitcom about a video game company. And although generally that is true, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing, Parks and Rec is one of my all-time favorite shows. I'm gonna type every word I know. Rectangle, America, Megaphone, Monday, Butthole. And although The Office isn't one of my favorite shows, just like everybody else in the world, I definitely have watched it all the way through. If you think about this show as a workplace comedy, it is very good still. But it is also a lot deeper than that. As the show went on, I realized the thing that I was looking forward to, the thing that I was enjoying the most, and what really mattered in this show was the people and the drama. And I was looking forward to the times when it got emotional and real, and I realized that this is more of a drama than a comedy. It doesn't seem like it because the comedy is the forward element, but everything that happens in the show has this underlying, more dramatic telling of this story. And that's what I want to talk about. So I first discovered this show because in my last video I was talking about Welcome to Wrexham and I realized that I didn't really know Rob McElhenney in anything other than It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. And I enjoy him a lot in Welcome to Wrexham, but I'm not a big It's Always Sunny fan. I've tried so many times to get into that show and it's really just not for me, which is weird because that's totally my kind of comedy. Wait. Wait, 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 wait no, I'm saying, no, the brakes! Guys, why aren't the brakes working? Because I cut the brakes! Wild card, bitches! Yeah! What? But I'm all about character development and story development. That is my bag. That is what I love about a TV show. It does not matter if I'm laughing senseless. If the show isn't going somewhere, I'm not interested. It loses me very quickly. So along came Mythic Quest with Rob McElhenney. And at first I was like, this is great. It's a, uh, it's... It's workplace comedy meets World of Warcraft. Nothing is more up my alley. I lost years of my life to World of Warcraft. So Mythic Quest follows the office and the group of people that are the higher ups that have made and are developing and continue to work on the MMORPG Mythic Quest, whose most common real world uh, comparison would be World of Warcraft. And it follows Ion, who is like the main character, though, it is an ensemble cast, but Ian, played by Rob McElhenney, who is the creative director and the creator of Mythic Quest. But outside of him, just as importantly, you have Poppy Lee, who was originally the lead engineer and then eventually becomes the co-creative director after him and Ian work through the fact that it's his game, but she has devoted just as much of her life and her vision to it as he has. Many of Brad, the, the marketing... Sociopath? Probably. He's probably a sociopath. Fuck you, everybody! And then you have David, the pushover executive producer. Joe, also another sociopath that is kind of the assistant to everybody. CW, the uh, writer for the game that has one of the best character developments and backstories that I've seen and they devote a couple episodes to it and again I will get to that and then you have Dana and Rachel the testers of the game and like I said the comedy of this actually is very good right from the beginning in the pilot episode I'm laughing my ass off at the dynamics of them but it also does just give off this air of this dysfunctional workplace family group that spends too much time together but in the end always work out their problems and I was like oh yeah this is, this is fine. This is Parks and Rec, The Office, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, Silicon Valley, maybe on the drama side, West Wing, The Newsroom, shit like that, you know? And it's not bad. I enjoy all of that. But where this show really brought me in was every now and then mixed in with the comedy. You have spectacular, more dramatic elements of character development. Moving scenes where these people just open up and there's not a joke for a five minute stretch and you're you're seeing this more deep level of them. You have entire episodes that go away from the main cast. And that that's what really makes the show and separates it from everything else. 
in this category. What I want to do is I want to highlight those moments to kind of show you what I mean. So very early on in the first season, halfway through, you have a complete story break where you go away from the main people that are that are the, the ensemble cast of this show that are trying to get out their new expansion. And you go to the past in 1996 and you follow these characters, Doc and Bean, who are played by Kristen Milioti and Jake Johnson. And they meet in a video game store and they're talking about video games. Doc, Jake Johnson is trying to get Bean, Kristen Milioti to find a game that she likes. And, and after so long of finding that sh there's nothing that she's really gonna enjoy, he's like, why don't you just make your own game? And she tells him this idea that she has for a game and he reveals that he is a video game producer. And as this episode goes on, we jump further and further into the future and they fall in love and they get married and they release this game, Dark Quiet Death, which is the namesake for the episode. Picture this, you and me in here toiling to bring our bleak message of fatalism to all the little boys and all the little girls suffering from unearned optimism. That's all I've ever wanted. But you see that as the second one is coming out, she does not want to make any compromises. She does not want to compromise the ethics of the game or what she thinks the art of the game is and makes it what it is but he just keeps making concessions for the sake of marketing and money and getting a bigger audience and eventually it drives them apart and after so much concessions that he makes she leaves the company and he ruins the game and gets it basically to be a children's game when it started out as this as this metaphor for life and dying and there's no no winning of the game and he realizes that he was wrong but it's too late she has already moved on and is married and has kids and he's just sad and lonely this is a bummer man that's uh, that's a bummer and it's fucking it's it's difficult to watch at the end but the episode itself is beautiful and there's really no comedy within it there is a little bit but i'd say there's comedy in it in the way that there's comedy in a dramatic show like in the newsroom, it was a, it was specifically a well-written drama show about these characters. And every now and then you'd have a joke, but it would make the joke hit harder because it's unexpected and well-written with these characters that you don't often see joke around. And that's the beautiful part about this episode. And it's used as a catalyst to outline a bigger theme within Mythic Quest as a whole as we go back to our main ensemble, which is these concessions and is these people that are constantly fighting with each other for what they think the vision is and what they think the right thing is but trying to keep the game as a whole together because that's the important part on the same lines as that episode in season two we have an entirely other episode that breaks away from the ensemble cast and follows cw the 80 year old writer for the game that in 1973 won a nebula award but we find out that he was a struggling novelist and he essentially stole his nebula winning novel from isaac asimov and pushed away his friends because he wanted to be better than them but he always kind of had his eye from the 1970s on on video games but nobody believed him when he said that video games are going to be the next big thing in art and in storytelling and until later on after he has abandoned writing and kind of washed out Ian approaches him to write for mythic quest and he and he is finally living through his dream that he discovered in the 70s but then in the episode directly following that one again we just follow cw who's reconnecting with one of his friends from back in the day and finds out that his friend is dying after after the entire day of trying to rub it in his face that he is successful and his friend is not successful and reconciles and it's a beautiful episode and there's a beautiful moment at the end where his friend is reading the book that he will never get released that is the finale for this 20 book series he's reading it to cw and those last two episodes that just break away from the tradition of this show are great and it, and it gives backstory to cw who's been this large character within the show that is kind of an enigma but more than that i didn't really care about cw that much until then he was just kind of the weird old writer guy that would talk about the glory days but after this episode i care deeply about him and that is the importance of of the world building and the character development of the dramatic moments is that you actually care about these characters within this comedy at the end of season one there's a two episode stretch in the first one 
where they're dealing with the fallout of COVID and everybody's working from home. It's a bit of a different storytelling way because everything is seen through the lens of a computer screen or a phone screen uh, while everybody's zooming together and trying to code apart. But at the end of the episode, Poppy Lee is, is struggling, but nobody realizes but I and that she is struggling until eventually it is shown that she is just having a complete depressive meltdown because she can't handle that. There's nothing to do and she hasn't seen anybody. And then it's revealed that Ian knew something was wrong and he walked to her house and when she opens the door, they hug and she just cries into his chest because somebody is there for her. And I can admit, I cried as well. I thought that I could handle this, but I don't think that I can. And everybody else seems to have somebody, but I don't. I'm just, I'm just alone. Open your door. Why? Just open your door. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Seeing that moment and bringing me back to that time during COVID, but also just that moment in the show of these two people connecting that are constantly butting heads but have a deep, friendly affection for each other. They're never romantic, and I appreciate that. It's a platonic affection and respect for one another. But putting aside uh, this type of head-to-head -head that they constantly have to, to comfort each other, it's a beautiful moment. And then the episode after that called Everlight, where the whole office is coming back together for a LARP event. And there's this final moment in the end of, of that episode where it just completely breaks from LARPing and it's as if they were the real warriors fighting and it's so fucking cool. And it's not exactly an emotional moment, but I was watching it and I was like, this scene within this show is different than anything I've seen in the nine episodes prior. And it just, shows what they're capable of. Each one of these moments and each one of these outlier episodes really show that the writers of this show and that the creators of it are capable of so much more than a workplace sitcom. And these moments make this more than a workplace sitcom even when you have multiple episode stretches where that's all it is. It's the jokes and it's the problem solving and then reconciliation at the end of the episode to return to the norm. And I had thought about it, and I thought maybe this show would be better if it was primarily a drama with a little bit of comedy mixed in, like an Aaron Sorkin show, like Studio 60 or The Newsroom or The West Wing, which are all dramas. That is the, that is the thing that is out front, but these characters in his show are always funny and they feel real, even though sometimes they all speak alike because Aaron Sorkin writes like that, and that's okay. I got thinking about it and I thought, no, this show works better as a comedy forward, even if sometimes the comedy falls flat, I'm always watching because I give a shit about these people. And the drama makes me, the drama and the character development and the, and the real relationships and difficult moments of their lives makes me watch three episodes that doesn't have any of this, but it's all building towards this moment where it's revealed that Ian is struggling with insecurities and the only one he trusts to show that to is Poppy. When it seemed like he was just being an asshole and Poppy wanted to prove that she was better than him. And then it shows the underlying insecurities of these people and what they need help with. And it's, it's, it, I, it feels ridiculous to talk about this show being genius. That's a strong word, but is there another one? But anyway, that's about all I have to ramble on about this show. The new season comes out soon, which I was unaware of, so when I got done watching season two and saw that the next season came out in just a couple weeks, fucking ecstatic, absolutely. But thank you for watching. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe. Check out my other videos.